Do you remember this scene from Titanic? Don't come any closer. I'll drop it. Of course you don't. It never made it into the movie. This is James Cameron's originally planned ending for the film. Instead of ending the film with a quiet, personal moment of reflection for Rose Dawson before dropping the heart of the ocean into the sea, the original ending was written as this extremely weird, high-stakes hostage negotiation that likely would have ruined the movie. You had it the entire time? <laughs> to say that this scene is just weird would be a bit of an understatement. But before we get deeper into this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic. James Cameron's inspiration for making Titanic came from a unique place. In a way, it was a vessel for Cameron to fund his own personal expedition to see the ship of dreams itself. James Cameron was obsessed with shipwrecks and he wanted to go on a dive to see the Titanic. There are rumors that the director actually pitched a docuseries on Titanic to Fox, who subsequently shot it down. He then pivoted the pitch to Romeo and Juliet on a boat, and Fox awarded him $110 million to make the movie, a budget that Cameron would exceed by about $90 million. There were a great many struggles on the set of Titanic, and one of the biggest hurdles the cast and crew would run into was often James Cameron himself. Titanic was bleeding money at every turn due to James Cameron's obsessions over small details. Things like stamping the White Star Line logo all on the dining utensils and lining rooms of the ship with real wallpaper raised the film's budget by millions. Now, this attention to detail led to some of the most incredible footage ever seen on film. The actual model of the Titanic itself was built using over 300 tons of steel. On top of that, James Cameron built his replica so that he could destroy it night after night. Every night, the crew would raise it, reassemble it, dry everything off, and get ready to do it again the next day. At one point in time, this film was bleeding so much money that one of the film's producers told Cameron that he had to stop making his movie the way he wanted to, and Cameron responded with, If you want to stop me, you'll have to fire me. And to fire me, you'll have to kill me. So to say that James Cameron is a passionate filmmaker might be an understatement. People who work with James Cameron often describe the process as being akin to fighting a war. On his sets, James Cameron gets what he wants and leaves very little room for anyone else to voice their opinions. If he wrote it into a script, they were shooting it. In fact, there is an estimated 2 hours and 40 minutes of Titanic footage complete with an entire romantic subplot for Fabrizio left on the cutting room floor. That's not just a few missing moments, that's more footage than the entirety of Avengers Infinity War. Recently, there has been a bit of a surge in various fan bases rallying together in attempts to get extended cuts of their favorite franchises re-released for their viewing pleasure. This has happened with varying degrees of success. Sometimes scenes get cut for terrible reasons. These are cuts that are usually made behind the scenes by producers or studio executives who don't want their films to lose out on potential revenue by making their film too long. Movie theaters can screen shorter movies more frequently, which equals a higher box office take. These decisions aren't being made with the overall creative vision of the project in mind, though. These decisions are being made because producers are thinking about what is best for the film's bottom line in the long term at the box office. In many cases, this leads to a lot of really great content winding up on the cutting room floor. Movies just can't be six hours long. This is where directors and producers are faced with some of the more difficult elements of their job. They have to make tough decisions about what to cut and what to leave in. This is where some of the business of filmmaking gets in the way of the art. Sometimes a director will have no way of telling what is working and what isn't until the entire film is assembled. It's sort of like putting together a puzzle in that regard. You won't have a clear idea of what the finished product looks like until all of the pieces are put together. And more often than not, you are left with a few pieces left over and some that don't quite fit. This deleted ending of Titanic goes well beyond the realm of not quite fitting. Just for getting off this godforsaken stretch of ocean and going home. In fact, it seems like it came from an entirely different film. The original ending shows Rose quietly walking to the stern of the ship, revealing that she is in possession of the heart of the ocean. And after a moment of reflection, she drops it into the water. The next scene shows Rose slowly closing her eyes and slipping into a bright and wonderful dream of her and Jack together. This is a perfect ending. It creates a nice, full circle moment and provides a nice personal ending for her character. The alternate ending wasn't nearly as nuanced, reasonable, or well-placed. Instead of following Rose on a deeply personal moment, the focus is on Brock Lovett and Lizzie Calvert as they are sort of down in the dumps over not being able to find the heart of the ocean. This moment is disrupted by Lizzie spotting old Rose at the stern of the ship. And then there's this sort of weird hostage scenario between Rose and Brock, where she threatens to drop the diamond if he gets any closer. 
Don't come any closer. This feels like a really desperate attempt at making the ending feel exciting, but the reason that it falls flat is that nobody throughout the entire duration of this sequence behaves or even speaks like a normal human being. I don't know what to say to a woman who tries to jump off the Titanic when it's not sinking and then jumps back on when it is. <laughs> it's a complete tonal departure from the rest of the movie. Rationality and logic are effectively thrown out the window in favor of this extremely manufactured dramatic moment. It's sort of this weird time to make this rushed allegory for classism, but that doesn't stop Rose from monologuing about what the heart of the ocean stands for. You look for treasure in the wrong place, Mr. Lovett. Only life is priceless, and making each day count. When Brock finally gets his hands on the diamond, something that he's been tirelessly seeking out for years at great expense to himself and others, Instead of holding on to it and having a discussion like any sane human being would, he instead lets Rose just sort of whimsically toss the diamond over the edge of the ship. They follow this up with some really classy dialogue. That really sucks, lady! And then they're dancing, and then roll credits. This ending wouldn't have just changed Titanic, it would have ruined the film entirely. For James Cameron to have put in all of this work in creating this ship down to every minor detail, taking $25,000 dives to the actual ship itself, and working his cast and crew like a military just to fumble the ball at the goal line would have been a complete travesty. But on the other side of that coin, this botched ending is actually a very good example of a couple filmmaking mantras, if you will. The first being show. Don't tell. Unless you're writing a James Bond villain, it never feels great to have a character just blurt out all of the exposition that a filmmaker could instead be showing us. It always feels better when we, as an audience, can put the pieces together ourselves. When a director makes the decision to explain situations through dialogue, it can sometimes feel like they're talking down to an audience instead of respecting their intelligence. The other mantra is the age-old saying that less is more. Brevity is essential to the filmmaking process, and sometimes you can say more with a single image than you can with a four-minute scene. Thankfully, James Cameron recognized this error and replaced the confusing 10-minute-long tonal shift with three minutes of footage that feels concise and important. The deleted ending of Titanic is fun to watch. It's silly and strange, and it would have, without a doubt, eliminated the film from any conversations about truly great cinema. However, viewing it comes with a lesson that sometimes your original vision for a film doesn't always play out in the way that you expect it to. Making a movie is obviously not a simple process. The path to just getting a film into production is rocky, uncertain, and treacherous. Just getting a film greenlit requires quite a few stars to line up. You have to have a script, get some big names attached, and hope that your pitch is exciting enough to executives for them to sign off on the project to move ahead. After that, you have to deal with countless notes, revisions, and changes from a handful of people who all have different ideas about how the film should be produced. Some of these people are just businessmen who want a surefire return on their investment and are thinking about ways to reduce costs and increase profits before they are thinking about what is best for the overall story. Some are directors whose egos can prevent them from taking valuable criticism. And sometimes studios will hire a famous actor to draw an audience, and that actor will end up being completely wrong for the part. The point here is, during the production process, there is a lot to keep track of, and it comes from quite a few different directions. Sometimes things can get screwed up along the way, and sometimes you can't really notice a mistake until you've already made a mistake. Being able to not only recognize, but admit that you made a mistake is a virtue that only the best filmmakers are able to harness. If you can spot these mistakes in time, you can save a project from, well, sinking into the abyss. And that's it for today's episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you see a couple of links, feel free to click them if you want to stick around. And thanks for watching Nerdstalgic.